The information in this podcast is current on the day of recording. It is general advice only and does not take a personal situation into account. It may not be suitable for you. Welcome to Stock Take. My name's Gaurav Sodi. There's no other analyst joining me today. Unlike our normal Stock Take episodes, I've got a special guest with me. Part of our purpose here at Intelligent Investor is trying to identify and understand awesome quality businesses. And most of the time we do that listed with businesses listed on the ASX. Um, and occasionally we come across a special looking business that's privately owned or, um, or investors don't have access to. I think that's still worth looking at in detail. And I wanted to bring one to the II community today. Now, this starts with, um, with, with, a, with a short story, if you don't mind. Um, before I introduce our guest, I was actually in the, in the Blue Mountains with my wife on a holiday in Katoomba, and we stopped by this little pub, and I knew nothing about it. And then as I stopped by, and we had, a, we had a burger, we had some chips, and we had this beer, and I just took one sip of this beer, and I thought, this is probably the best damn beer I've ever had. And we actually spent hours at this place, um, and I tried, it's probably the most I've ever drunk in, in the last um, 10 years or so, because I just wanted to try everything. And as soon as I got back, I did some research about the business, um, contacted the company, um, Intelligent Investor went over and visited the business. Um, the founder gave us a tour of the facility, and I'm pleased to say that he joins us here today for a conversation about mountain culture. So welcome and thank you, DJ McCready, who is the founder of Mountain Culture. Thanks for your time today, DJ. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's exciting to be on here. It's my, <laughs> hey, one, of, one of my first uh, official podcasts outside of beer. So, Outside of beer. Well, that is exciting. I, I, I suppose when you, when you started this, never thought you'd find yourself in a, in a niche um, investing podcast. Now, DJ, tell us. People may not be um, may not be um, familiar with mountain culture. Give us a brief background about what the business does and um, and how you got to where you are. And then I want to get into some of your background as well because I have a, a fascination with, with with beer brewing actually, and and we'll get to that in a second. So but tell us a little bit about the business. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we started up Mountain Culture in 2019. So my wife, Harriet, and myself, uh, we opened up as a brew pub uh, in Katoomba, which you have uh, visited I've... and shared uh, to my delight. Had a lot of beers up there and uh, hopefully- I think I had all of them. I, I, I had all of them. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I tried everything yet. there. <laughs> but they'd take a photo of you and put you up on the wall. <laughs> I wish so, I, I wish they did. Uh, I wish they got some out. from there, by the way. It was great. Oh, terrific, terrific. Um, so, so yeah, so we, uh, you know, really wanted to tie the brand to an area that we loved. Um, you know, beer brewing to me uh, involves a lot of creativity, uh, a lot of time working, you know, on the creative process of, uh, you know, innovating and developing new flavors. So, being in the Blue Mountains, uh, it's just a, an, an awesome place to do that. It's a very eclectic community, uh, you know, lots of artists, lots of musicians uh, in the area. And just, you know, it's a beautiful backdrop for it all. So when we opened up, we really wanted to be part of that community, which, you know, we successfully achieved um, and open up our, our pub there, essentially, to use it as an area to test out, um, you know, the products that we were developing uh, and get direct feedback from people when they were coming in to the brew pub. So, yeah, so when we started out, it was very, you know, small operation. I, uh, you know, my, my wife and I were, were doing a good chunk of it all ourselves where, you know, I would be brewing in the morning and she would be working on social media posts. And then you'd find us in the afternoon, I would be frying chips in the kitchen and she would be behind the bar slinging beers. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's pretty, pretty organic start, uh, but that's just what we could afford, you know, at the time where we, we wanted to start out, we wanted to be selling direct to customers. Um, and then, yeah, we had a pretty wild ride with business, obviously opening up as a hospitality venue for the most part in 2019, 
specifically in the Blue Mountains to where we faced a lot of challenges, you know, uh, opened up in October in 2019. By November, the whole place had caught on fire and we had these horrific bushfires in the mountains. And, uh, you know, I remember thinking, well, everybody told me when I was getting into business, you're going to face a lot of hardships. And uh, yeah, I thought, wow, we've made it through those bushfires. We've got our big hardship out of the way. It's all, it's all free and clear from here. Uh, and then, and then uh, <laughs> things got a little bit harder for hospitality oh. venues after that. <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah, but, um, you know, at the time we thought, look, this is death sentence. We've, uh, we've given it a crack. Uh, we, we opened up our business. We went through the, the whole effort of, of getting it started and, you know, lots of businesses fail and that's, that's the reality. But, um, when COVID came through, we did what any good entrepreneurs would do. And we looked for the opportunity and the opportunity for us was to bring our brew pub experience to people's living rooms. So we transformed the business from being being a pub into being an e-commerce business and we started canning our beer sending it around the country uh and being involved with people's lockdown by doing virtual tastings and <clears throat> going through doing doing tastings all over zoom introducing them to our products and things just went gangbusters from that point we went from being a small little uh local blue mountains business to having a national brand pretty much overnight. That's amazing. One of the things I noticed about Mountain Culture, I thought it was quite quite unique, was the decision, the, the two things actually, DJ. First of all, was the deci decision to tie the product to a geography. I, I don't think I've seen that happen too often. Usually, it's not unusual for a beer brand, it's actually the norm for a beer, beer brand to try and create a unique identity, but yours is tied to a specific geography. What was yep. the reason for that? Was that was, was that a, a brand building exercise? I mean, did you was that a very conscious decision? Talk us through that. Look, a little bit of both. You know, um, we wanted to tie it to the area because one, just Harriet and I genuinely love the Blue Mountains. You know, we we wanted to be in an area that uh, we were inspired by, and we felt like that would get the creative juices flowing. Uh, you know, to the uh, to a great extent for us, but also um, we've always been very marketing-led organization. And you know, when I think of what marketing is meant to do and, and advertising is to, you know, create a feeling around a product. And I loved the visual images that would come up for myself when I would think of the Blue Mountains. You know, I would think of adventure. I would think of amazing weekends away you know that were were close to home but just in a in a different world i would just think of this like vast wilderness area um that was pristine and undiscovered and and it, you know i really would you know um evoke a lot of emotion for me and i loved that idea of tying that to uh, to our brand how much of the beer industry. I mean, when I when I look at the industry as a consumer, you know, the the product is quite differentiated across each brand and each specific beer. But when I put my analyst hat on and look at the industry, uh, I view beer as a um, as a marketing business, not really a beverage business. Um, well, what do you think about that? Is is this industry um, a beverage business, or, or is it actually a marketing business? I'd say it has a foot in both camps, to be honest. Like, you know, I, I think that craft beer in particular, uh, there's there's a lot of, you know, marketing around it. It is a, a, a giant opportunity to get people excited about more than just the actual liquid um, in the glass. Like, you know, for us, we start there. You know, we, we pride ourselves on being the best in the the business on making the best tasting and the highest quality beer um, that we possibly can with, you know, constantly investing in, um, you know, our process technology, uh, the ingredients that we're bringing in, in the talent that we're bringing in into the production team. 
But I also think that there's so much more that goes into it with the creativity that's that's on the labels. You know, I, I see a lot of it and like people are o- almost looking at it as like a collector's item where it, it you know, it gives our our design team uh, that real ability to to express more uh, out of them just the liquid in the can or um you know when we we do look at the marketing behind it, it's creating community it's creating uh you know places for people to go to connect over a product um that's not just necessarily linked to the product itself um you know it's all it's, it's also just giving giving people something to to talk about um it's it's yeah there's i think a, a lot um behind the marketing of the liquid itself but i think that could be said about a lot of um products that go from just utility to premium to luxury yeah yeah um the other thing that was unique about mountain culture was your distribution strategy i mean if i was thinking about doing a beer brand i would um get the product ready and then look for distribution points, um, either retail or um, or in hotels. And I think I've seen that exact strategy replicated with, with a lot of your competitors as well. But you decided to set up your own venue and initially only had distribution from a handful of, of venues. Ex- explain that to me, DJ. Because if, if you were if you came to us as a startup and said, "Look, this is my plan," um, it sounds like a crazy plan to begin with, but it's clearly been extremely successful. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Uh, we actually got that a lot when we were a startup, and we were we were going to uh, you know potential investors at the time, and you know explaining what we wanted to do and uh, the long term strategy behind it. And I think a lot of them were like, "Okay, that's that's a that's a weird idea, and you guys <laughs> yes. have no idea what you're doing." Obviously, so we decided, well why don't we just do it ourselves and we'll just, you know, we'll bootstrap it and we'll, we'll see how it goes. Cause maybe this is some kind of half cocked idea, but you know, for us, the, the strategy behind, um, mostly selling direct to consumer was one, the product quality and the instant feedback. So for us, we've always very much, um, you know, brewed beer that, Cons- like our customers want to drink and that are interested in. And a lot of that is involving them in the journey of how we create those recipes. And for us having that more intimate relationship with our, our fans of like getting it, basically making the product and handing it to them. And then in, in whatever way we can, whether that be using you know, following what's happening as far as social media chatter or through, um, you know, beer rating systems online, getting that feedback in and, and being able to um, shift the products that we're, we're creating uh, really quickly, I think really led, you know, a lot to our success. Um, we've always wanted to do things differently as well. Like we've never, we've never really been followers of the traditional uh traditional path like we would rather create our own path and for better or worse uh see where it leads us so you know following the the herd in craft beer has never been anything that we uh we focus on we're always very much insular we've you know we we stay in our own lane and uh we hope for the best it is amazing how many fantastic success stories begin with an absolutely bonkers sounding idea. Um, and I think when you think about it a bit more, um, it kind of makes sense because if the idea didn't sound bonkers, someone probably would have done it already and uh, the opportunity wouldn't be there. You know, the thing that pops to my mind is Airbnb, which sounds like an absolutely ludicrous idea. Share your yep. room, share your couch, share your house. Um, yep. But um, th- that thing has been uh, obviously an incredibly incredible success so i like these i like these crazy stories um we look then we always Sorry. say that you know we're always like if if everybody in the room likes the idea then yeah, yeah. we know that it's it's not a good idea it's not worth going going down that channel because it's already it's already been done it's too safe like if it doesn't actually scare us to go and do it then it's it's not going to move the needle 
I love that. I feel that as an investor as well. If, if my best investments have been made, um, not with me being excited and thrilled, but with me being terrified and and sweaty. You know, like the the, the fear is the indication that you're actually doing something different and you're probably doing something right. You know, if it, if it feels easy, it can't be the right thing to do. Absolutely. Look, the other thing that um, fascinates me about beer is that here is a product that has four basic ingredients, and yet there is so much differentiation. Even with you as a, within Mountain Culture as a brand, every product you've released is is quite unique. How do you do that? What, without re- revealing too many of your brewing secrets, DJ, how do, how do you, what's the, I mean, how does that happen? Uh, it's a rabbit hole, uh, you know, honestly. And like, this is, this is like, you know, for me, what I think has always just kept me one in the beer industry, um, right. but then two, you know, I, you know, I, I kind of see these things linked with, uh, actually running a business is, you know, there's, there's never any mastering brewing like it's impossible you know there's there's all these brew master certifications yeah, yeah. but anybody who's actually a brew master will, will will laugh at that because there's always something to learn um there are four ingredients but the you know the the different techniques in process the the smallest tweaks on what we do with you know water profile and minerality or you know, when we add ingredients or temperatures that we use during fermentation or these small tweaks can have big impacts on flavor. Um, so, you know, it's, it always gives us a license to keep experimenting, to keep, you know, innovating on the way we're, we're making our product. And, you know, I personally, as when I was in my brewing career, always found that just fascinating. It didn't, doesn't matter how ADHD I am, there was always something new to tweak. There was always something new to learn. And, you know, I think I've taken that same philosophy with, you know, now running the business is that, you know, I see that as like entrepreneurship and and running a company is that there's always something new to learn. There's always different tweaks that you can make to running running a business that, you know, have, have big impacts on like the way the company's going and the success that you have, um, as far as a company with the, you know, the culture and the, the team and the success of the product and the market and, and all of those things. So I, I, I see them as, as very, uh, actually similar, uh, philosophies behind, you know, being a, a brewmaster and being, you know, involved with creating, uh, creating recipes and developing products uh, and as well as running a company. As a, as a consumer, um, Mountain Culture probably has the most prolific product range that I, I can think of um, in the category. And one of the things I've noticed is that when I see a new um, product, I, um, I it doesn't give me time to think about it because I, I, I know that it's not it may not be repeated. It may not be available next time I'm there. And so I kind of have to grab it there and then. So it's a really good um, consumer strategy as well because it removes um, the, the logic and rationality of me as a consumer and forces me to act impulsively because I know that product isn't going to be there. It's, it's probably a, a something you've just worked on that afternoon or or on a day and it won't be repeated. I think it's a, it's a really good um, really good consumer ploy. And um, I curse you for it and I thank you for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you know, I mean, we look at those products like experiences, you know, and again, it's another, I guess, <laughs> you know, a, a, a bit of a uh, <laughs> airy fairy approach. But, um, you know, we we look at uh, those beers as like it is like an experience, you know, it's like we we have them, they're there and then they go quickly, uh, you know, and a lot of that's driven by like the ingredients that we can get at the time. We're always, you know, we're always on the hunt for, you know, new hop varieties, new malt supplies. A lot of times that's very limited to the amount that uh, comes into us. So I see. Being able to create one of those recipes is something, Mm -hmm. you know, that is hard to repeat a lot of times. So, you know, like we we do have products come and go. uh, Yeah. (laughs) Very often. Very often, yeah. Now, DJ, your own background, I know you've actually, you've, when you started Mountain Culture, you were aided by um, 
a degree of um, of fame in the brewing industry. You've got um, a bit of reputation. You've come from a big brewer. Tell us a little bit about the differences um, of between working as a brewmaster in a big brewery and and doing the same job in a startup. What, what's similar and what's different? <laughs> In a big brewery, you always have somebody else to blame <laughs> when something <laughs> goes wrong. Uh, when you're doing it all yourself, uh, you, you, you've got all the fingers pointing back at you. <laughs> um, but no, look, uh, it, it's it's like in, in any kind of, uh, I guess, business. Uh, you know, when you're when you're part of a large organization, uh, a lot of the times it's it's less about getting your hands dirty. It's more about leadership. It's more about, you know, your communication skills, how organized you are, um, how, uh, how well you can lead a team of different personalities to achieve an outcome that you're looking for. Uh, being a startup brewer is like, how good are you at using a mop? <laughs> <laughs> So really as getting well as, your hands dirty. Yeah. As well as how creative you can be, you know, and and um how you know, like you're you're doing everything. You know, it's it's you're you're unloading uh bags of grain off of a truck to writing recipes to you know, uh running your own beers through your own sensory panel of one. Um you, you know, so I, I really do think that like I've always liked flip flopping from one to the other, like Coming over here to Australia, uh, you know, my first first gig that I was, uh, you know, brewing in, uh, coming from a, a really large uh, production brewery in the states, was you know I started out as a as an army of one uh, there, and it, it was really it was really good reminder of like wow you just you you need to know so much to do it right, and uh, it's it is it is really different than being able to say, oh, yeah, you know, I know a lot about this, but I'll just hire somebody who's really good over here and they'll, they'll handle that part. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I like, and, and look, I, I genuinely enjoy both. I think it's really, uh, you know, it's really good to know everything um, about the process. If my son came up to me, my nine-year-old son came up to me and said that I want to learn how to brew beer, what is the... Um, what, 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 what's the process? Is there is there a structured stream? Is there a profession, or is this something you just tinker and experiment with on your own? Uh, I mean, it obviously depends on the outcome that you're looking for. Like, there's a lot of people out there that love brewing beer as a pastime. You know, they're, they're home brewers. They you know are are making beer for themselves and their friends to drink. Uh, and you know, if if you're looking to get into things as a hobby like there's a lot of great you know literature out there there's i mean you learn how to do anything on youtube now so uh you know there's there's so many resources for that um professional brewing uh isn't necessarily a different um process as far as like you know the ingredient use and things like that but um there's obviously uh a lot of um I guess, manufacturing knowledge that needs to go into actual professional brewing. Um, and the stakes are a lot higher, so it's much more calculated. So these days there are uh, really good uh, educational um, sources through, you know, local colleges, but also overseas programs. Um, before I left the U.S., I was a instructor for a program called the IBD. So it's the International um, Brewing and Distilling Course out of the UK. Um, so they have some really good literature uh, there uh, and like standardized testing to rank where people, you know, are at with their knowledge of beer brewing. But, you know, I think it's like any kind of uh, any kind of profession, like having a good baseline knowledge is a is a nice start. Uh, but then there's also the, the practicality of working in that industry and and getting the, the real life experience that I think is is very important. So somebody's looking to become a professional brewer these days, I think there's a lot of resources out there uh, for education. And then, you know, there's a, there's a lot of breweries out there that, that need brewers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How did you get your start, TJ? 
I started by sweeping floors and putting labels on bottles and Isn't watching- that what you're doing now? That's kind of the same thing you're doing now, isn't it? I haven't really progressed that much, to be honest. Right. I still <laughs> clean the toilet, change the <laughs> light bulb. <laughs> so you, were you working me inside- payroll. <laughs> were, you, were you working inside a brewery and then moved into the actual brewing function, or were you always a brewer? Um, I no, how to no I, I wasn't I wasn't always a brewer um you know I I kind of stumbled into the industry to be honest I I started out as a home brewer I have a really competitive personality so I had a roommate at the time who was also a home brewer I uh was fortunately uh unemployed um by being laid off of my my, my real job that I had so I had a lot of time on my hands and I said you know, if uh, I go and sweep up the floors of this brewery that's just opened down the road from my house, uh, I bet they'll teach me a thing or two, and I, I bet I'll get better at making beer than my uh, my roommate. And wow, that would be pretty, that would be pretty fun, uh, you know. So I went. I just kept annoying them. They didn't they didn't really <laughs> want to borrow me at the time, and I just kept kept annoying them. And just I think I I got in there, just picked up a broom one day, and started sweeping stuff up. And, <laughs> They gave me like a case of old beer. And they're like, thanks. And I came back and they're like, oh God, I can't get rid of this guy. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> after about three years, I ended up being the place that's had brewer and running production for. <laughs> and wow. uh, I got my uh, my start in the industry and um, yeah, ended up uh, having a lot of, you know, on the job learning uh, as, as I grew my career. And what happens now for Mountain Culture? Are you, are you able to disclose the the volumes you produce? Yeah, absolutely. So we've just gone through our third massive expansion here. So from the tiny little brew pub that Harriet and I started in the Blue Mountains to where we currently are, uh, just celebrating our fourth birthday, uh, we've had we've had some pretty big growth. So our annual production when we first started out was about sixty thousand liters of beer per year uh with our expansion that we've just completed here at emu plains we're actually able to achieve that production now in a day so oh, wow it's, uh, okay <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pretty uh been a pretty uh big growth but uh yeah we're um right now we're we're operating at about producing you know roughly four four and a half million liters per year but we have potential to grow this place, depending on how we complete the factory expansion, up to about 12 to 14 million liters of, of volume per year. Um, so we're sitting in a, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting spot. We're definitely um, leading a lot of the charge as far as independent beer production here in Australia at the moment, um, especially under just our own label. There's a lot of brands out there that have gotten our size that are and maybe creating a little bit more volume, but they're doing it for several other brands. Uh, whereas here we just focus on making mountain culture beer. Your status quo, which is probably the the flagship beer, that won the best beer in Australia award a couple of years ago. Maybe even last year. You you'll, you'll correct me. Last I'm sure. Year. Last year, yeah. Thank you. Um, and um. There must be a tension between pumping volumes of that because you have a kind of a, a fixed production um, a volume. There must be a tension between pumping out what sells really well and continuing the experimental culture and and um, using some of your facilities, uh, reserving them for for new things. How do you deal with that tension? Because it must be tempting just to continue selling stuff that was already working. Absolutely. Look, I mean, that's, it is definitely a juggling act. Like we, uh, we pride ourselves on being nimble. That's the, the great part, uh, about the company that we've built is that we've built it around people that love organized chaos. Uh, <laughs> but we see that, uh, that limited program, uh, and doing R and D batches is so important to, Okay. constantly keeping our core range the best in the industry um that it's something that we just we can't set aside you know we're constantly using our r d to improve um you know our techniques to experiment with 
different, you know, products, different, different, uh, you know, styles of brewing, different, you know, tweaks to, you know, water profiles and, and, uh, you know, hop usage and all of that kind of stuff that we can then take and, um, in a very calculated way, uh, shift the way that we produce like our core range. So status quo, for instance, where, you know, we can take our learnings from the R and D and, and apply it to those beers in a way that we know isn't going to damage the product reputation because we see as a company, the, the, the thing that we care about the most is, is the brand and the trust that people have with our brand. Um, so being able to use those limited beers to experiment and then to enhance and keep our core range constantly cutting edge and constantly improving is just something that, you know, I think is really at the, the heart of what we do. I have two more questions, DJ, and then um, I better let you go back to, to mopping floors and brewing beer and running <laughs> the important um, stuff. <laughs> the important stuff. Um, look, the, I just wanted to touch on your distribution strategy because um, I have seen you now in more and more um, hotels and on tap, and I imagine that is quite an um, an expensive distribution strategy to pursue, but potentially also a very lucrative one. How does that compare to the uh, canning operation and going through um, the website or through um, liquor retailers? Which which would you prefer, or is there a preference? Oh, look, you know, um, at this point, I'm really, really happy to see mountain culture getting out so much. Like, I think that it's, it's really important to, you know, look at all distribution, um, platforms, you know, and a lot of the times we're finding different people on all ends. And, and that's the part that gets us the most excited is that, you know, our product is reaching uh, you know, a more and more diverse crowd. So, you know, like our, our people who are buying directly from us, they're, they're big fans. They're, they're looking at, you know, our limited program. They're really part of the process for us, you know, like they're really part of the process, like, you know, in creating what mountain culture is and, and improving the recipes. They're the ones that are buying the, you know, the limited beers that are giving us feedback on it and really shaping what mountain culture is. But we see it as, you know, being the the leaders in the independent uh, beer scene over here is that we need to be creating more interest in craft beer in general. Uh, there's a lot of smaller breweries constantly popping up. The, the rate that breweries are popping up isn't necessarily matching the rate of interest from like mainstream consumers. So for us, being more present in in pubs, being more present in larger retailers um, is really important to creating more interest in the craft beer industry in general. And, and we see that as, as our responsibility for where we're at. So, you know, though it's a, it's a different, um, it's a different method of distribution than what we were founded on. It's, you know, it's something we're really excited about, you know, it's something that like, for me, like getting a beer into somebody's hand that is already interested in the beer industry, you know, craft beer industry is great, but my pa- favorite folks to see it is like, they're like, they've just been on like, you know, Carlton their whole life. And then they <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. try status. They're like, what the yeah. hell is this? And then they trade yeah, and they're like, yeah. wow, this is really cool. Like what the hell are you guys doing? Um, you know, so those are the ones that, you know, I, I don't know. I, I find so exciting to, to be part of and, uh, you know, getting, getting in some more, uh, retailers is just helping us achieve that. I had that experience with, um, your oat cream. I think that was the first one, um, I tried and then that was, that was the thing that just blew me away. And, um, I've always been interested in craft beer, actually. The, the, your, some of the other successful, successful craft brands, um, Stone and Wood and Bolters, their ultimate endpoint always seems to be um, an acquisition or a takeover, um, being submerged into a much larger um, brewing operation. And that makes sense because this is really a volumes game and a distribution game, and the margins can expand dramatically once they're inside a larger network. What do you see the, the future 
for mountain culture? Where do they go from here? Are you determined to be independent in five years' time? Is mountain culture going to be um, a brand that's, that's probably going to be inside another network? You know, I don't have a crystal ball, so uh, I, I, I'd love to say that I have, you know, I, I would know exactly what's going to happen with mountain culture in five years. Um, for me, like, I just constantly come back to, like, what's going to get the best product in hand? Is that, you know, does that mean that we stay independent? Does that mean that we, you know, are part of a, you know, a larger brewing group? Um, like, that's really what it's coming down to for me is like what's what's going to be best for the business what's going to be best for the beer um you know i i don't really see us being in a position like some of those other brands that we would need to you know join a larger you know larger brewing group um we're we're in a pretty unique position to where you know harriet and i still own 100 percent of the company um uh, like I don't, I don't think that there's another brewery here in Australia that's gotten to our size. That besides Cooper's, <laughs> that's still just. And I actually don't know Cooper's uh, structure that well, so I might be speaking a little bit out of turn here. But um, you know, as far as as far as the network that we're surrounded by, we're in a really unique spot to you know keep controlling you know the company just on our own without any external influence, which, you know, I know uh, a lot of the other breweries that have come before us and that are still operating around us, they're not in that position. So I think it's really, it's really unique that you have a brewery the size that's still 100% owned by literally, you know, a brewer and, you know, somebody who's, who's running marketing and having a lot of fun with it. So, yeah. Is Harriet behind the can design? Because I love them. I think the cans are just so um, so uh, yeah. important to the brand now. Every every time I've mentioned mountain culture, the person I'm speaking to, the first thing reaction I get is, "Oh, the cans." You know that the can mm -hmm. design is such an important thing. Is that is that Harriet doing that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. so Harriet's running, um, you know, all, all of the sides of the, you know the brand. Um, so design team, the language that's going out to, to people around, you know, our communication, uh, the, the wittiness that we've had, you know, on social media and, and the way that we're just communicating with our, our fan group is all of Harriet's, uh, pet project. I love it. Look, um, thank you so much for your time today, DJ. We'll let you get back to, to running the business. Appreciate, um, the product and appreciate you spending time with the pod today. All the best. Ah, oh, amazing to get to chat to you. Looking forward to uh, catching up in the brew pub to run through all the new beers I'm sure we'll have by the, the next time you get up there. <laughs> I will be there for sure. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you.